This is Londonderry, a once peaceful city in Northern Ireland. The Roman Catholic neighborhoods of the Bogside and Cregan are about the size of an average southwestern American town, and for a year they held off one of the world's toughest armies. It all started back in the 1920s when England granted home rule to all of Ireland except Ulster. There, the majority of folks were Protestants and they quietly developed a political system that made niggers out of the Catholic minority. Adequate housing, employment, and the votes were almost forgotten in places like the Bogside. But the 1960s brought some changes. At just about the same time that Martin Luther King was gunned down, a Catholic civil rights movement met with violence from Protestant extremists. The Troubles triggered a split in the illegal Irish Republican Army. The provisional wing was traditional. The approach, bombs and terrorism, the goal, a united Ireland. The official wing was Marxist. The method, guns and politics. The aim, a socialist state. In August 1971, the government sought to crush militant Catholics by imprisoning without trial suspected IRA members. The people of the Bogside and Cregan responded by barricading streets and closing their community. Official IRA man Peter Collins was interned that August. He spent his 24th birthday in jail. Shortly after Peter was in prison, Tommy McCourt signed on with the officials. At 23, he's wanted for murder. And then there's Catherine and Phyllis Devlin, two Spencers from the Cragen who work in a nearby shirt factory. They're all characters in a confrontation with the outside world. That showdown started on a cold and windy Sunday in January 1972. March promised that the would be nonviolent. The army have said throughout the day that they hope to use minimum force. But three hours after the procession began, this has ended up as the worst ever confrontation between the army and the Catholic people of the Cragen and Bogside. have you seen in the bog side? Appearing to be dead. There are the three in that Saracen car. There are two men lying at the end of this block of flats. There's another man at least very close to being dead. There's one. There are two others up there. I'm told that there, there are some more in these flats here that I haven't seen yet. I would say there are probably about four dead at this moment. Uh, I don't know what those are doing, whether they're alive or dead. 
Colonel, once the paratroopers went into the bog side, there seemed to have been a very large number of casualties. Well, I suppose large, uh, five is quite large in these circumstances. It's unfortunate. But when we got up there, past William Street, here where we're standing, and uh, up towards Rossville Flats, uh, we came under fire. Uh, we came under fire from the bottom of the flats, from the flats. We were also petrol bombed, and uh, some acid, in fact, was poured on us from the top of the flats. Local people are saying that you used excessive force when you went in there. Well, what is force? If you're being fired at, you return fire, and they know that perfectly well. How many gunmen do you feel you've hit in the bog side? Well, I'm told from my quicksit trip that three gunmen were hit. You have no worries about this action? None at all. But when darkness finally ended that bloody Sunday, 13 people were dead. And the barricades, well, they had more meaning. I was born in the bog side. Loved here all my life. I reckon I had a happy childhood. Knew everybody in the bog. Every door was open. Just like a big commune, you know. I've seen a weary miner scrub cold dust from his bike and I've heard Miner's children cry for coal to heat the shack. Yet those banks are made of marble with the guard on every door, and the vaults are filled with silver. That the workers sweated. This place in here reminds me of people that died and the struggle that's going on, you know. First time I ever saw anybody getting shot was Seamus Cusick. And there was a bit of a riot on, you know. It wasn't much, it was just before people had really turned against the soldiers. It was the young fellas, the odd hooligans, as they were called at the time. All of a sudden, out of the blue, this soldier stepped out in the middle of a small riot. And bang, Seamus Cusick fell. He was hitting a thigh somewhere, you know. And uh, I remember watching the thing, you know, and I lost a fucking head. And I run at them, shouting and roaring, calling them murdering bastards and all this bit. And, uh, you know, I was stunned, like, because it had never happened in Derry. It had happened in Belfast, and we had heard about it, but we had never actually seen it. And everybody was stunned, and when they round Derry, like wildfire, everybody was talking about it. The next day, there was all these demonstrations. People stayed off work, building sites come out, factories come out. And there was this big, massive demonstration down to the Strand Road barracks or somewhere. And uh, 
It ended up in a confrontation. I up at Butcher's Gate. And the army charged down Fawn Street. We were fighting away. And we got round on the, uh, my own street, Westland Street. There was, the Saracens came up the Leggy Road. And everybody was standing there, you know. And all of a sudden, out of blue, two nail bombs. They were one of the first nail bombs that had been thrown in Derry, you know. Or some of the first. Nobody has ever, nobody has used them. They just landed right in the middle of soldiers. Well, I ran up the street and I stopped. And I was standing talking to this girl. And I uh, heard a couple of shots. And the next thing somebody says, somebody's been shot. And everybody was saying, who was it? And people were running around. And the next thing somebody came running over and says, Desi Beatty from Rosemount was shot dead. Well, the girl I was standing with just turned out it was his girlfriend. They were getting engaged the following Saturday. There was riots for about two weeks after that. 24 hours a day. The army claimed that Desi Beatty was a nail bomber and Seamus Cusick was carrying a rifle. Well, I mean, everybody in Derry knew that wasn't true, you know, including myself. And there was these rats we surrounded Essex. We had them sealed off for two weeks almost steady. And there was all these, uh, we, we used to do this thing, we used to say that when the, you know, when the army released the internees, we'd release the troops from Essex. Well, that really applied then, you know, because, uh, they couldn't get out. They used to drop on supplies by helicopter, and it was like a, it was like an afternoon picnic. There was about two thousand people, and there was about maybe one and a half thousand sitting up in this field, and they were watching the other five hundred rioting. And every now and again, people out of the five hundred that were rioting would come up and sit down, and others would go down and take their place. And it was a continuous thing, twenty-four hours a day. The next one was a net McGavigan. There was a bit of a riot on, and I was up throwing stones at the army, and I got hit by a gas canister, a rubber bullet. I think it was a gas canister. And I fell, I was up at the front of the riot. It's my usual place, anyway. And I fell, and uh, I remember the brother-in-law and this girl picked me up and sort of helped me back, and the army was making a charge. When I got back down, it was this wee young girl, you know, and she says to me, you know, well, you were lucky there, and all. And I says, geez, I nearly got caught. She says, oh, you're lucky it wasn't a real one, you know. And I says, I know you're talking. About an hour later, like, the riot sort of continued, and it died down a bit. But an hour later, there was a nail bomb was thrown at the army. There was a bang. And then about a minute after that, or two minutes after, there was four, three or four shots rang out from the army. And I was just standing around the corner. I seen this body more or less swinging around the corner, you know, hitting the ground. Well, I, at the time, it didn't sort of strike. It, it was just some gear. I left her well, along with all of some other people. Took her into the house. Well, the house was packed. You know, everybody was coming in to see what was wrong, who was hitting, was she dead and all this. So I more or less fucked everybody out, you know. I just said right out. And it left the body and me in the kitchen. And I got down, like, and I looked at her, and it suddenly struck me, you know. It was the same girl that had helped me earlier on. I remember looking at her, you know, and she was lying. And the eyes were open. She had sort of prominent teeth, you know, and the lips were back like this. And uh, I just looked at her, and I was fuck me, you know. Some wee girl, like 15, I think she was. People say they are a terrorist, murderers, and stuff like this here. Like, what do you do when you see 15-year-old girls get shot dead? Or innocent men shot in the street? You have no choice. You've got to fight, you know? What we done was we said, well, we're going to stop the deaths in our area. We want them out. And in order to keep them out, we had to use the same forces they were using. We had to use guns. And we built up a free dairy area. We built up barricades, and we said the army aren't coming in. And we stopped them with any means that we had. If we could stop them with guns, we used guns. And we stopped them with the people coming out and sitting in the barricades. We did that. And the whole reason was to keep them out, because... We saw what happened when they were in. When they were in, people died. Innocent people died. I was born in Derry. I was brought up in Derry. I went to school here. I've been here all my life. My grandfather was a member of the Irish Republican Army. My father was officer commandant of the IRA. As a child, I was pushed around in a pram with guns under the mattress. And our home was always used for secret meetings. I grew up with the IRA. You were never told anything about the Republican movement, what my father was doing, what all these strange men coming into the house was all about, you know? There were meetings going on in the house. As soon as these little well, the men would start arriving, you were put to, uh, you were put into another room. My mother would come into the other room because she wasn't allowed to know what was going on. And, uh, it wasn't as much that you were told, but there was something deep down in your gut there that said this is something to do with the IRA. 
Uh, my father's route was with the gun. Get the guns out, free Ireland, let the people decide. Which were exactly my attitudes up to a couple of years back. And um, it's actually the provo line now. That they say that they should do the fighting and then let the people decide. But it's no good saying let the people decide when the people have nothing to decide about. I changed without knowing it. Simply and solely by being in the company of people who didn't know what they wanted. Who had the political alternative. This is Johnny White I'm talking about. And listening to Johnny. It was an education in its own, although I didn't even realise that at the time either. We'd be out there for a drink, you know. And Johnny would be talking away there about socialism and one thing or another. And I even, those days I even looked at Johnny White purely and simply as a politician. There is absolutely no mention of the number of pensioners in this area or the number of young married couples who are forced to live on a measly standard of living. The whole issue of the economic conditions under which people live was never referred to. It has never been brought up by any of our liberal bourgeois politicians in any Westminster or Stormont Parliament. Okay, we'll the struggle being wasted at the present time is a struggle for basic democracy of the people. Now, the people of this area have taken up that struggle. It's the people of this area who have taken upon themselves to fight against oppressive legislation in order that they may go forward, go forward in the struggle for complete emancipation. And no one but nobody and no party or organization has the right to take away the will of the people and to dictate the terms under which the people will give up this struggle or under which they will say on behalf of the people, we will have enough and we will stop here. When I was picked up and got internment, I had 10 months to really realize then what Johnny was talking about. And it was in long case that I realized just that he was spot on in everything he said, that this was the alternative, that the reason I was interned, the same as a lot of other fellows, was simply because of our politics. The Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Mr Whitelaw, toured London Derry. It was Mr Whitelaw's first visit to the city since his appointment by Mr Heath. And while walking through a shopping district near London Derry's no-go area, Mr Whitelaw met Catholic housewives. Well, I would love to. Oh, you'll you have to come up. Well, you'll just have to make sure I can. Be very nice to see you. Very nice to see you. Well, I'd well, like very much to do that. And you tell some of these people that you hear that. Just, yes, well, yes. I would love to come Everybody's there. Everybody's welcome in the Craig and... Well, I would love to come there. You just say uh, that. That's very good. Of course, at the moment you couldn't go unless you had a strong military force to take you in there. Well, uh, I would have to see. Uh, but obviously, I have to have regard to the current position as it stands. But I very much hope that people there, all of them will see. But they have nothing to fear. My immediate reaction after coming out of Long Kish and seeing all the men that we have now, like where were they before internment? Have I was stopped at a roadblock there? Some of these young lads know that they didn't know me. I was you no know, thinking in my own mind. Who in the name of Christ do they think they are? Where I had absolutely no right to say this. As it stands now, I have got greatest respect for them same fellows. They talk about it here. They talk about it there. They talk of revolution everywhere. So work and class unite and come and join the fight. It's a fight for a socialist republic now. You've heard of Fianna Foyle from Cork to Donegal. They still claim to be republican. But sure there is no doubt that they have sold us out. Uh, let's fight for a socialist republic now. You workers must unite. Uh, the capitalists who we must fight. Exploitation we must end. So stand by your demands. Uh, the power's in your hands. Uh, let's fight for a socialist republic now. They talk of liberty, Ireland, oh one and Ireland free. 
to the day oh, we will take down the tricolor. So stand together now and raise our sturdy flow. It's the flag of the Socialist Republic now. So listen to what I say. Come join the IRA. Let's fight for the ideals of Connolly. Oh, let us agitate, organize and wreck the state. Let's fight for a socialist republic now. In Northern Ireland, American evangelist Dr. Billy Graham has visited bombed areas while in Washington, Senator Edward Kennedy discussed the Ulster conflict with our correspondent. You would think that the United States could offer its good uh, offices. And a realization that you have a pluralistic society, that you must live together. Uh, there are firings across the border now in the North. That there's a false religiosity. So this is an international uh, dispute. And I think this is part of the problem. That uh, as a friend, uh, I would hope that there would be some role that the United States could play to, to uh, end the violence. There's a provisional wing of the IRA and uh, there's the official wing. The official, the, uh, the provisional policy seems to be that they're going to, they think they're going to bomb and shoot and blow practically British imperialism out of this country, shoot the British army out and all the rest of it. We don't believe this is possible. We think you've got to use politics and we've got, you've got to involve the masses of people. The official's policy on violence, as you might say, would be um, defence and retaliation. That would mean the uh, defence of the area, and so far as that if the British Army is trying to come in, the official IRA would get themselves involved, trying to get the people on the streets to stop them. But if the army started shooting, something like this, the people there obviously wouldn't stay in the streets. So uh, what would happen would be the IRA would then have to involve things, would then have to involve themselves in a gun battle with the British Army in an effort to keep them out. Um, the policy of retaliation is that if the British Army, as they do quite often, shoot somebody innocent in the streets, then the IRA would uh, say, well, we retaliate for this. They do this by either attacking uh, foot patrols in the street or an army post like this one back here could be a target. So this could be done by sniper attack on the post or bombs. The IRA would do this in retaliation. Um, the reason for retaliation, like, most people might sound like a sort of knife for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Well, this isn't the facts of the case. What it is is simple that uh, if you're going to say to people, we'll defend and we'll help, then you've got to prove yourself as a viable organisation to do this. And uh, the, the way you do this is when a civilian's shot, you in turn uh, shoot a soldier. The reasons, again, and all reason for this is that you obviously have somebody murders somebody, you want to bring them to justice. Now, when uh, the British Army murder people, it's been tried before, bringing them through the normal sort of courses of law and order. You know, you had Bloody Sunday, the Woodjury Tribunal, you had various cases where soldiers were brought up for murder and they got away with it. It was open verdicts and things like this were recorded. So, I mean, if the system is not going to bring murders to justice, then the IRA will bring them to justice. The people will, in their own way. And the only way they have, if we haven't access to courts, access to jails and things like this, then the IRA retaliate themselves. And the only way they can do this is by the bomber bullet. And that does the policy. I mean, people will retaliate. The people will defend themselves and retaliate in the only way they can. I mean, that's the way it goes. I believe in the power of evil. I believe there is a devil. I believe he's stirring people up to get one group to hate another and to fight against another and shoot another. And this can only be combated uh, by another spiritual force, and that must be the force of God. And that can only be let loose when people show concern and prayer. In other Northern Ireland news, the Londonderry Chamber of Commerce announced plans for the acceleration of a city-wide industrial expansion program. Chamber President Mr. Frank Gookian said that recent events and impressions created by the mass media may well have hidden the true picture of a city which is determined to succeed in its efforts to create a fully employed, viable community. The expansion plan met with criticism from militant labor leaders who cited poor working conditions, low wage scales, and seasonal layoffs in the city's existing factories. Meanwhile, provincial unemployment percentages increased to 8.7%, more than one point higher than last month's total. 
In Londonderry, some officials estimate that as many as three out of four men in the city's no-go district are receiving unemployment benefit. Basically, a way of life in the bog side. I've always been the sort of person who, if there was someone who was the underdog, I always liked to help him. And uh, I became involved on in October the 5th in the first demonstration in Derry. I got battened around the head with the police. Saw my friends getting battened. Saw my area getting invaded by the cops. And uh, I adopted a policy of doing something about it. I didn't know exactly what or how or anything else. So I uh, became involved in the local elections that were coming up. and. I went for the underdog again, which happened to be a socialist candidate. Uh, at that time, I had no particular politics. Uh, through that election, I became secretary of a young socialist in Derry and got involved with uh, socialism, with politics in the area. Began to know what was going on, began to realise what the system was all about. I used to argue with people. If they put up a better argument than me, defeated me. I used to go away, get an odd argument and come back. And if uh, defeated them that time, I knew my argument was right. I never read any socialist books, I never read Lenin, Marx, Trotsky, or even Connolly for that matter, you know. The point is that in society like Northern Ireland, we have a special powers act operating. And under the special powers act, you're not allowed to do certain things. You're not allowed to, like if you're a member of Sinn Féin, which is the political wing of the IRA, you're not allowed to go down to Guildhall Square and stand up and say, well, I'm a member of Sinn Féin, this is my political beliefs. Because if you do, you're interned or lifted. You don't want a repeat of last January's events, do you? No, sir. But we've got to break every barricade before the IRA obtains better weaponry. You're aware that Ulster is pregnant with no-go districts. In London, there, the barricades are here, 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 and finally here. The toughest and most suicidal diehard roam these streets. 
I owe 400 our tanks will have crossed the bridge and the assault will be launched from here. Our supplies will be stationed 1,500 yards from that area. It's the British Army or any other force hits the people, tries to put them down, try to come and raid their houses. And the IRA has no alternative, in my belief, but to defend them by whatever means possible. Hello. Hello, Dublin. Uh, this is Terry. Listen, uh, that bit of gear we're on a bit before, you know. Well, we need it as soon as possible. How long do you reckon it'll be, you know? Thank God you lads are finally going to kill those fucking tanks. But listen, I got all the stuff here. You can have your anti-tank rocket in the best part of a day. Ah, uh, okay, that's dead on. Well, listen, we'll send somebody down, you know. And, uh, he'll call in, see and collect it. Bring it back up. Okay? Aye, uh, that's fine. All the best, then. Black flag was hoisted. The pearl deed was over. Gone was the man who loved our land so well. The Money a sad heart in Dublin that morning when they murdered James Conley, the Irish. Won't your armor be exposed to ambush here? They can't stop tanks. Isn't this road dangerously close to the border? I've decided on another road where I'll join the unit. As soon as my command car is ready, gentlemen, it'll make the trip to Ulster alone. It's a well-armored Hamber pig, uh, recently reacquired from a civilian dealer. Of course, I'm having it spruced up a bit. As I was climbing into bed, my poor old granny sighed. She looked out over the window, the army had arrived. The house was soon surrounded, they smashed the front door in. I knew that Tom did take away the lid of my granny's bed. And it was strange, I shout, we're raising up a bin. We're going to spread a warning when the army is coming. A soldier come right up the stairs, a rifle in his hand. She kicked him with her button boots and along the hall she ran. Well, up and stepped another one, some medals for the win. But all he got right up the go with a lid of my granny pen. And it was strange, I shout, we're raising up a wind. But God spread a warning, the army they come in. She opened up the window and she clambered down the spout And soon her bin was rattling for to call the neighbours out She then pulled out her whistle, she blew away like hell And soon we heard the echo and the neighbours blew as well And the stream by shout, raising up the din But God spread a warning when the army they come in the music rose like thunder as the bends and whistles fled. The army soon retreated and knew that overstead. It wasn't made of silver, it was only made of tin. But once again it seemed to speak, the let him a grandly spend. I hate the scream, I'm shot. Raising off a pen, but not a spread a warning. Anti-tank rocket. Our first to hit against the fucking BA. How good is it? Well, it isn't exactly a H-bomb, but it'll kill a tank at the range of a mile. Catholics in London, Londonderry protested against the official IRA's execution of a British Army soldier who was a resident of the area and home on leave. This murder was committed in our area, and it is to our shame that it took place. It was done in our name, as if it were done for us. We protest about it in the strongest possible words. I know that the people of the Gulf side and the Craigan estate are aghast. Last night, 
The women showed their strength. They showed what the people of the Kregan Estate and the God say think. We want them to continue showing that so that this violence will cease once and for all and that peace and justice may come. Thompson submachine gun. Everybody, in my opinion, has got his own ideas of his ideal weapon. I prefer the big T myself. It's the only weapon that I pick up and say, by Jesus, I've got a rod in my hand. She seemed to fit my hand perfectly from the first day I picked her up. Take us through the weapon. Look at the muzzle. Four side blade. Barrel. Air cooling fins, of which there are 28. Your cock and handle with a fixed battle sight. Your cock and handle way, your cock and handle recess. Now, there's a lot of things I would say to Tommy about the big T. You know that at a distance of six or seven, eight hundred yards, you get cut blazes out of the BA, which is a lot of nonsense, but I'm not going to say that to Tommy. You know, I'll defend the big T no matter the hell what he wants to throw against it, let it be a jet. You know, people might know this, you know, but. Big T's can shoot down a jet at a thousand feet in the air. <laughs> right? Next, you turn the weapon under your arm. Your release button. Just ease it forward. Never force it. When you take a certain distance, she'll stop. Just squeeze it on your trigger. Take your pistol grip off. Cup your hand over the back. Now this is your main recoil spring. The reason that you cup your hand over here is because when she's released, if she springs forward, your hands cup the stabber, right? Bring your breech block back. Just tip her over. Bring your cock and handle forward. Turn over again. Now I'll name these parts for you. Now. I'm going to name the parts for you. Look at your magazine, your butt, your pistol grouping, your main recoil spring, buffer, buffer pilot, and flange. Right? Your breech plug. If you look towards the center, See the firing pin protruding through it, right? You get your extractor and your ejector. Right, you. What's that? Four side blade. You. What's this? Four plus a grub. You. What's this? Hurry hell. Do you remember the day we went out in the first civil rights march? We walked over the bridge and then we all assembled over at the old railway station in the water side. That's right. Mm. And we thought there were only going to be a few hundred people there. Oh, I was amazed when I seen so many people. There were 20,000. Amazed? Mm. Yes. Everybody went out. Do you remember we mm. saw all the doctors, our doctor, and mm. all the priests out of the cathedral parish? Mm. I remember Fallon Mulvey walked in front of us. Yes, and Fallon McLaughlin was there too. Yeah. And all the students are the queens. I couldn't get over the young people. They were great. So they were. Yeah. Weren't they? Uh, that's right. It was great. Mm. And we came to the bridge. I remember I felt this feeling that I was free for the first time that's for 50 right. years. Mm. We always felt we were held down. We never really got, like, we never really went out and showed our feelings, did no. we? No. Well, we didn't have a chance. No. Because we always felt that, you know, we were being kept down. We didn't know why. 
So we walked over that day, and I remember when we got to the middle of the bridge, we had to sit down because the RUC were at the far side. That's right. And they wouldn't allow us to cross the bridge, cross through the gates up Carlisle Road. No, no, you would never cross no, through the gates. No, because we were gates. going through the walls. Mm. Do you remember, we were That's going through right. over the old walls. Yes. And that was reserved for the orange men. Do you remember? That's right. You yeah, never we often got through tried those. Get, mm. So, imagine in your own town. Aye. If the lads up north can kill just one tank with this wee rocket, it'll be a hell of a victory. It'll put the fear of God into those bloody British haydens. Yeah. Hey, how are you going to carry it? I'm going to have the son of a bitch welded underneath my car. There are no flowers blooming But the shamrocks still grow Or the grave of James Connolly, the Irish river. Many years have gone by since the Irish. When the guns of Britannia, they loudly did speak, and the bold array, they stood shoulder to shoulder. We didn't know the boys then, Catherine, you remember? But, um, you remember when we used to be going to our work in the mornings? Well, it was a cold winter mornings. And they were all sleeping in these old cars. No. I thought a pity of them. And oh, we had so much room. And That's what, it bothered my conscience. Yeah. When I thought in all the room we had and they could have been sharing them, you know? Yeah. So, you remember the night Joe came? We were in bed. Mm. Yeah, that's right. And uh, when he came up the stairs, he put on the light, and I called out to him. I remember he opened our bedroom door, and he said, what room do I go into? And I said, <laughs> we were all amazed. <laughs> and uh, he said, um, what room do I sleep in? And I called the room at the end of the corridor, and I called, put out the light quick, because we were afraid the neighbors would see him. That's and, right. Well, we didn't. We thought the ARA were a terrible crowd then. We I didn't know you hear so much talk about them. Well, they like, just you know, don't. We fell asleep like anybody right. else, I think. Mm. First time I joined the Irish Republican Army, there was an initiation ceremony. This isn't done anymore. But uh, it was to prove if the men were responsible that were coming into the movement, if they could obey orders, one thing or another. What I had to get through was there's a very close friend of mine. And there were five of us, including him, went over the border to Donegal. When we got down there, I had been told that there had been uh, a court martial. We were taken to Donegal. And we got out of the car. The five of us walks up this hill. Two of them grabbed me mate, throws him against this hedge, pushes a 45 Webley revolver into my hand, and he said, uh, This man has been court martialed. He's been found guilty. He's to be executed. You're to carry out the order. I cocked the Webley, fired four rounds. The gun was empty. But it proved to them that I was willing to obey orders. There was one they kill even my best mate. And uh, the way I look on the thing is that if it has to be done, then it has to be done. Somebody has to do it. Squires, the movement checked you out. You're the perfect cover on this job. Warned of sectarian conflict. Meanwhile, a member of the official IRA, killed during rioting in the north, will be buried this afternoon in the Republic of Ireland with an IRA guard of honor. In other else to the unemployment. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Let us pray for our brother to the Lord Jesus Christ who told us, I am the resurrection and the life. The man who believes in me, even if he dies, will never suffer eternal death. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in the night of the hour of the night. As it was, it never shall be worth the death of man. Command, Provisional IRA, Friends of Tobias Malloy, the Dairy Command, Official IRA, once again we are assembled here in silence to bury one of our dead. It has become a very common thing for Irish men to assemble around the graves of Irish citizens murdered by the forces of British imperialism. And here we have now another Republican who was killed, as it would seem, ignominiously by a rubber bullet. Now remember, rubber bullets are supposed to be not lethal. They're supposed to be for scaring away the youngsters throwing stones. But here we had a British soldier who shot at point blank range an Irish citizen, a member of the official Irish Republican Army. And on behalf of the Army Council, the Northern Command, and in particular, the Derry Command of the official IRA, I wish to offer my condolences to the relatives of Thomas Malloy.
people, I wonder what would our Lord say if he came amongst us as a man today? What would he say about the destruction in our city? What would he say about the recent slaughters going on in different parts? My dear people, our Lord would condemn those who have continued this violence. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that provoke offenses and all who are evil and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and grinding of teeth. Only a few men actually nailed our Lord to the cross, but there were the bystanders who approved. Now, all of you could examine yourselves and see whether you have been supporting violence so that by condemnation you are responsible. There are day rose from the dead, as the scriptures had foretold. He ascended to heaven where he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Back in 1960, there was a fellow killed here during a training session. A revolver went off accidentally. And uh, strange way history repeats itself. The... Um, lad was killed just in a few months ago just the exact same way during a training session a revolver went off accidentally I personally don't think about death or about dying it's something that uh, you just have to take for granted in this, this sort of a game if you think about death you automatically uh, become slow in your reactions when you have to do something when you're waiting, the waiting's the worst part. When you're waiting to go out to do a particular thing. So if you do start thinking about getting injured or even killed, you immediately have to try and put it out of your head. You must be worth it 100%. If you don't, you're going to make a ball zone. It could lead to you getting badly injured. It could lead to you getting someone else injured. It could lead to you getting killed. But there's, there's always the consolation, more or less, of knowing that they said the one that kills you, you'll never hear it coming. Catholic Church, they never backed any struggle of the people. You can take a man's life just by making him accept injustice that has been perpetrated upon him by the state. The Catholic Church was willing to do this. To be a socialist does not necessarily mean that you have to give up religion. The teachings of Jesus Christ is through socialism. You know, do unto others as you would want others to do unto you. In my personal opinion, you don't get any more of a socialist statement than that.
Yeah, this is Squires. Well, it's going okay so far. We'll make it before night. Okay, I'll find him. Bye. I don't want to see anybody hesitating at all whatsoever. Right? Move out. Number three, keep your rifle at the high port. Any obstacles that's on your road, you will not bypass them. You'll step over them, jump over them, or fall under them. Drop. Number four, if I have to tell you to spread yourself out again, I'll spread you at the right road. What sort of a lion position is that? Get yourself right around there. Get into that position in future and stay in it. Right, move out! Drop! Come on, number four, you should have been dropped! If you're right-handed, you'll come to the right-hand side of the tree, not the left. Get to the right! Number three, cover your rear end! What are you doing out in the open? Get into your fucking behind the tree there! Move out! Come on, move it! Number three, you better smarten yourself up! You're supposed to be covering your front, cover it! You should have been in that position the minute you were told to drop! Right, number one. Come on, move it! Come on, man, move it faster! Number two, take up the position whenever you get to the bottom and you shall observe your front and sides. Come on, two. Number three, come on, man, move it. You're going to have to get your rifle cut up when you move. Number four. Come on, get your rifle up over your back and move. Come on. We are the army of the people, and as such we must defend the people, the same way as the people defend us. Without the people, we can't exist. We wouldn't be able to hold on to our big teas or sweet damn all else. A delegation of women from London Derry's no-go district have met with Mr Whitelaw. The women, leaders of a Bogside and Cregan Peace Committee, said that they represented the majority of people in the IRA stronghold. I was more than and surprised an honest man. that he was so enlightened about the problems in there. What did you expect? He is a gentleman. Well, he's a gentleman. And believe you me, I, it's the first time I met Mr. Whitelap. 
I hope it isn't the last. And I was a bit scared, believe you me. <laughs> what do you think the IRA's reaction to your coming to see Mr. Whitehall is? I couldn't we tell don't you. Know home. Does, does it concern you that they might be angry or might they take might. sanctions against they you? They might. We might be tarred. I don't, don't think the IRA... You're not going to be deterred off the issue. The IRA don't... We're not scared of the IRA. Our whole job is to be able to bring the gun and politics together, to create a revolutionary movement, and by doing so, to create a revolutionary situation where we're not just fighting for the tricolour over the guilt hall. Now Jack Lynch came down from Dublin and he had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the border and he marched them down again. As such an armor column lads, the light was never seen. Five hundred mounted bicycles all wearing all the green. Help all them tarry, sink or let them swim. He doesn't hear the damper, a army a damper. He sits on his horse in Dublin, and I hope he doesn't die. Set out a country party, sing this little boy. Relax, squires. The only thing they'll ask you for is your passport. No, I see you in your bike too. I mean, she's not all she's critical, do you? What good is she against the flag face and the PA? But look, you must take into consideration the reasons that the big tea was made. The three main reasons for it are street fighting, house cleaners, and cover fire. Right. For those reasons, there's not another weapon in this town that can match the big Listen, I'm not talking about the other weapon on the town that can match the big tea. I'm talking about an effective weapon on the town to stop a British Army coming in. That is an effective weapon. That is. It's the only weapon that they run for cover from. Well, you've seen it well, on the TV, you've so seen it <laughs> happen in a Belfast where they're standing there throwing everything at the BA. They just stood there. Yeah. They stood there, corners, everything. Then out of the darkness, the big lady speaks. <laughs> oh, jeez, nugget. <laughs> What's the first thing that happens? Some That's officer not... class starts shooting. There's someone using a Thompson, there's somebody using a Thompson. Everybody dies for cover immediately. Yeah, but I'll tell you when that. That's, that's when, when they came on force and the magical weapon of the ARA was a big Thompson. This was not when they came on force, Ty. Yeah, it was. This was on, in the past nine months. So they were on the TV themselves, the British Army standing with the Thompsons, and the boy saying, what do you think of it? He says, it's a very cumbersome heavy weapon, it's not very effective. Yeah, but the point when of the they, thing is, they, they are when not they up, their... When they held up the ZO3 or an army leader and the SLR or something, then they said, no, there's a weapon. Yeah, but this is all very famous. You're taking them out of context. You're taking out of context what we're talking about, about the values of the weapon. I'm sorry, aye. No, I'm not. I'm you saying the value, the value of the weapon in Derry for stopping the British Army coming in. And I don't, think a big, I don't think a big T is any value for stopping but the British talk, Army. You were talking before about a grease gun, for The statistics for the grease gun, or as she's probably named the M1 machine gun. M45. M1. M45. M1. Well, it's marked on the M45. That's her caliber. That's a, what did I tell you? Our rate of fire is 300 point something something rounds per minute. The big T is 600 point something something rounds per minute. No, I don't agree. Now, you take it another way. The grease gun is fully automatic. Mm. Right? Oh, well, I mean, okay, so there's refinements on the Thompson. was shattered by violence as more than 20 bombs exploded in Belfast and Londonderry in a two-hour period. It was one of the worst days of terrorist activity since the troubles began in 1969, and at least 11 people are reported dead and more than 130 others injured. The provisional wing of the IRA has admitted responsibility for the bombs, many of which, authorities say, went off without adequate warning. Warehouses, a car dealer, crowded shopping districts and a bus station were among the targets and were left in either blazing infernos or masses of rubble. The devastation provoked strong and outspoken response from loyalist leaders. They demanded that the government direct security forces to beat bombers and gunmen into the ground while smashing IRA no-go areas throughout Northern Ireland. Yeah, well, if the, army, the British Army do move on here, you know, there's going to be a lot expected of these people. I know that. 
and the provos, if they start opening up, you cannot expect that people to do it in the streets tonight. No, I know that. Yeah. Some priest, that they got up in the altar the day, you know, in the sermon, they were saying to the people, he was very nervous and all that, but he kept saying that from like that, we all know that this thing is going to happen. He didn't say exactly what it was, you know. He was saying that there'll be some serious events in Derry over the next weeks or week, couple of weeks, and that there's old people here and uh, nervous people and all those who are, aren't old or aren't nervous, they help the, those that are. And, to be prepared to meet their God and all this, but you know, there's obviously talking about an invasion in there, really. I am quite clear that I am not going to take purely military action which is going to cause substantial casualties, in my judgment, to innocent women and children. I don't know, I can see a hell of a lot of people dead in this convoy very shortly, you know. Yeah, and even this town being good. Yeah. You know, Belfast had gone through it. There he is yet to get through, did he? Well, there he is. It's bloody Sunday and all that, but they hadn't really concentrated all the time. It all happened in sort of periods, you know, like yeah. two hour periods, and then it will piece the honor, will relative peace for so long after, yeah. and then another big thing. Yeah. But, uh, but the people are battle weary, Tony. Oh, uh, people are battle weary. I mean, let's face it, every day and every night, like it's good shooting, yeah. shooting. And the bombing. unfortunate thing about it is that th this was all going on, it's achieving absolutely nothing. Yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you a news bulletin. We've just heard that Mr. Whitelaw has announced heavy troop movements in various parts of Northern Ireland. The object, the statement from Belfast says, is to enable the security forces to move freely throughout all areas and so to protect the whole community. Meanwhile, our correspondent in Londonderry reports that the army has placed a ring of steel around the city. He says armoured cars seem ready for what looks like a move against the bases from which units of the illegal IRA currently operate. Our correspondent says that rumours have circulated the city for almost a week. Some say that the IRA plans to hit troops with massive new firepower, others that all of the barricades have been mined, and still others that... Listen, leading IRA the yellow cartoon has just gone through. For the of the you lads might want to check him. Just before the dramatic announcement from See the past, it was learned that military aircraft are landing stockpiles of supplies and equipment, and an assault ship is stationed off the Northern Ireland coast. It's thought that the ship may be used as an army communications headquarters. In addition, patrols and roadblocks throughout Northern Ireland have been increased. It was also learned in Londonderry that additional armoured cars are on the way to the city and may be used as reinforcements for a barricade-smashing operation. It's like Peter says, Johnny's a command, and if he says we don't fight, we don't fight. Get a word to Tommy. What are you doing here, Mr. Squires? You're a long way from California. Just doing a bit of driving, seeing the sights, that's all. Right. Now face the car, put your hands on the roof and your legs apart. Okay, open the boot. The what? The boot. The boot. Oh. 
Yeah, that's right, that's right. Oh, cool. I'm like, horsey, you always tell me she doesn't drink. They all need my own house. They're sitting down there, you know, she got half stewed. She's just all crawled out. And she says, no, I wouldn't let you just sing like that. You can hang on to me later. I'm not very good. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Good to see you, sir. What, do you get three Yeah. You got, get it on there? Yeah, uh, it's a bit dicey. Yeah, do it on. Yeah. Well, as long as you got it on, it's not that fucking... What are you only doing hard stuff for us? Well... But still, I don't know whether they'll gain anything bad at all. They may and they may not. I don't think it'll be in our lifetime. You think no? I don't think so. I oh, think the next I generation. Do. I do think it'll be do in you? our lifetime. Well, maybe in yours, not in mine. Oh, I'm too old for that now. <laughs> oh, God. I think, I oh. think it'll be in our lifetime. Do you think so? Yes. Mm, I don't. However, uh, they're so nice fellas. You yeah, I mean you can understand their feelings mm. about workers who are exploited in this town. I mean, look at us, the way we work so hard and all we are. That's right. No, it's ridiculous. Mm. Like when we were young, we never thought in those things. Did no, we? never. No, no I don't no. know why we were so stupid not to. Of course, we wouldn't have made anything of it. I mean, you have a lot to be thankful for them. Like, you know, they're, they're here and they're protecting us against the British Army. Well, that's true. I mean, if they weren't here, who was going to protect us? Uh, Who's going to protect no, that's us? That's true. See, if the British Army come in here tonight now, they would come in and they would raid all the homes and take the men out. No. larger than anyone had dared to predict, the army began its move into the bogside and Cregan at about four o'clock this morning. It was some six hours after Mr. Whitelaw's dramatic announcement from Belfast. More than 1,500 troops in 300 armoured vehicles cleared perimeter as well as internal barricades. The security forces quickly established key checkpoints throughout the former no-go area. The army called the operation Motorman and said that they encountered virtually no resistance other than a burst of submachine gun fire. They said that five gunmen were hit and two are believed dead. Security forces made it clear that their main objective was to restore law and order, and in their words, to get the IRA off people's backs. In an interview in Belfast, Mr. Whitelaw was asked why the IRA had been given so much advance warning that the troops were coming in. I felt that I had an overriding responsibility to the civilian population as a whole to make it perfectly clear to them that measures were going to be taken, that there would be considerable activity, and that it would be in their own interests to keep off the streets. I'm very glad to say that they responded very well to that. And I think that it was my duty to do everything I could to prevent civilian casualties. In undisputed control of the area, the army later in the morning occupied schools, flats, and even the Bogside Inn, said to be the headquarters of the official IRA. In a major mopping up operation, troops used handheld metal detectors to search houses claimed to have been used by the IRA. Car checks were intensified, and traffic on most streets was brought to a virtual standstill. Other army units checked pedestrians in an effort to seize bombs and small arms 
thought to have been distributed to IRA supporters in the former no-go district. The army believes that the IRA has hidden its major weapons in dumps outside the city, where they could be retrieved for use in future campaigns. Meanwhile, in Belfast, Protestant as well as Catholic barricades have been restored. The Bogside man is the man for me. He's caught recruiting in the RUC. He was the Bogside man. Steady on your aim with a petrol bomb. Don't throw it, son, till the peelers come. I am the Bogside man. To Belfast town, no specials came. They looked up the sky and it started to rain with the Britain. Steady on your aim with a petrol bomb. Don't throw it on till the peelers come. I am the Bogside Man. If the British Army do come in here and take over the area, the lesson must be learned is a people's spirit has left them, and we must be held responsible to a certain extent. Peter and his comrades learned some pretty hard lessons. Some of his buddies are gone now, but Peter stays on. Specials came in brown and black. Your granny ran out and they all ran back. She married the bogside man. Steady on your aim with a petrol bomb. Don't throw it on till the peelers come. I am the bogside man. Johnny White always said that it was impossible for a guerrilla army to tackle a superior force without popular support. He's now on the run. The fact is that these are the real issues which confront us as members of the working class and will confront us as members of the working class regardless of whether there's a barricade standing in Russell Street or whether there isn't a barricade standing in Russell Street. We're all browned off with the midnight raids Every man to the barricade We are the bogside men Steady on your aim with a petrol bomb don't throw it on till the peelers come. I am the bogside man. Tommy McCourt stayed on for a few days after the army came in, but hiding out in the bogside was too dangerous. He's now somewhere in southern Ireland. If I do get hit, I'd like to at least have a minute or two to gear my thoughts before I die, you know. Maybe there's a god or something and... You might have a last minute repentance or something like that there. I mean, I don't know. What have I Said the fine woman. Oh. proud old woman did say 